Of course, we know that emotions are the, are the trader's worst enemy. Or principle of the markets, that Bollinger Bands uh, are a tool. They're not a trading system. That's what this is all about. This, this is about in, improving your results. Very small changes can have very big long-term impacts on our performance. The most important thing in trading is to have a, a rigorous process that'll keep you out of trouble so that you can come back tomorrow to trade again. That's the path to success. Trading system that you create yourself from first principles that you can execute and trade. Trading is a privilege, don't muck it up. So, hello to everyone and myself and Nat Mirat would like to welcome you to the fifth episode of the Market Talk series. Today, we really have the privilege and honor to have as our guest, Mr. John Bollinger. Just a few words about this uh, exceptional gentleman. John Bollinger, it's an American author, financial analyst, and um, with a huge contribution, of course, to the field of technical analysis. And he's the developer of Bollinger Bands. Now, his book, Bollinger on Bollinger Band, that been written uh, in 2021, if I'm right, has been translated into more than 10 languages. Since 1987, he has published the Capital Growth Letter, a newsletter which provides technical analysis of the financial market. Without saying any further, John, welcome to our Market Talk series. Thanks for inviting me to spend uh, this hour with you, Theo. Absolute pleasure. So, uh, I see a lot and a lot of people joining us, and that's awesome. I couldn't expect something else, to be honest. Uh, it's a unique opportunity, not for uh, for us in Admirals, but also for our audience to have you live as a guest, a special guest. And if you allow me, I will start by asking you first, how did you start your career and what makes you get into the field of trading? <laughs> Well, it probably started when I was a kid. Um, my grandfather gave me some shares of a stock um, at that. It was the the stock was the Fruhoff Corporation, no longer with us. Um, but um, it was uh, sort of the tech stock of the day. It was the beginning of containerization, and they were a company that that manufactured um, containers. Uh, it was just, you know, we were getting the first ships that used containers and 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 trucks and stuff like that. So what it was was the tech st a tech stock of the day, of, uh, you know. And of course, uh, when my grandfather gave it to me, it was a bubble stock. So from the time he gave it to me, it did nothing but go down. Okay. <laughs> and so that was a that was a really good lesson, you know. Um, and then from there. Um, I, when I when I was going to school, I I had a job, and one of the one of the one of my bosses was was really really into the market. His father was actually a very famous um, over the counter market maker, and um, that kind of rekindled my interest. And then um, the final piece was really interesting. My mother um, was, owned a small advertising agency, and she was preparing to retire and she was getting really terrible financial advice. Um, okay. And the interesting thing was, is that she, um, she recognized um, that and wanted to make a change. And she called me up and said, she knew I was interested in stocks in the stock market and such like that. And she asked me if I would manage her retirement. And um, that was the beginning of my transition into the markets uh, full time. Wow, that's awesome. And uh, like, that's, that's really interesting because when you, you just said that everything was going down, I think it's something similar with what we experience today in the, in the financial sector. Now, uh, what was a, a moment that you could say it was a defined moment in your trading career? And then how did you came up developing the 
Bollinger Bonds? Well, a defining moment would have been 1982, um, uh, 1981, from the, say the middle of 1981 into the into the middle of 1982, the last half of 1982. Um, I um, had been, I had had a seat at a brokerage um, firm and been pretty actively trading. I was an option trader at the time, and I quit that to apprentice to. Uh, an options and futures trader for a year. So I, I worked for him for free for a year, um, keeping his charts, uh, real-time uh, point figure charts by hand and and keeping um, a trading blotter and, and uh, some indicators that we used uh, to make our trading decisions. So that year uh, was really a formative year. He had a He had a pretty good library of technical analysis books in a closet and, um, I started reading those. He had a copy of a very, very important um, uh, newsletter at the time called the Texas Traders Trendex, which was uh, uh, a really, really important uh, formative um, uh, material for me. Uh, it, it, if if it were if it were still here today, I would still subscribe to it. Um, it was a fantastic wow. service. Wow. So that year, that whole year, they're reading those books, keeping those charts, creating the indicators, keeping the indicators by hand, um, watching him trade, understanding what was going on. That was, you know, the, the most formative year of my career. Awesome. And then how it came and you uh, you came with the idea to develop the Bollinger Band. What was that fascinating uh, thing about the indicator because uh, as we're going to move on to the session, uh, we understand that many traders, um, unfortunately, although they have in their disposal numerous of indicators, they don't use them the way I believe they have to use them. And uh, they make their trading a bit complicated. Uh, so can you explain us how did you came up with the idea and slowly we get into the implementations of the Bollinger Bands? So the, so uh, as I said, I was a pretty a active options trader. Ap after I left that, um, that apprenticeship, I went and um, uh, sat at a, um, ag again, I sat at a brokerage house. In those two days, quotes were very hard to come by. Um, so really the only place you could get them was by um, sitting in a, in a brokerage house. And brokerage houses maintain desks um, for active traders to use. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting at a desk trading options, and um, I, I was very lucky. I had an, an early microcomputer um, with a spreadsheet. And one day I was I copied the formula for volatility down in the column, and I saw volatility was changing um, over time. Now, you, you have to understand that at the time we thought that volatility was a fixed quantity, like the house is blue or, or um, um, you know, the weather's warm, some, some, something like that. It, it wasn't dynamic. It didn't change over time. Okay. Uh, so so I, I saw that volatility was changing, and, and, and I had a problem um, that I was trying to solve. Uh, at the time, we were using what we call fixed width trading bands. It was simply a moving average shifted up and down by a given percent. Um, and uh, a popular trading system at the time was to take a 21-day moving average of the Dow Jones Industrial Average and draw 4.5% bands around it. So you'd, you'd have the average, and then above it, there'd be a band 4.5% higher, and below it, a band 4.5% uh, underneath it. Wow. We kept uh, we keep two indicators. One was a, a 21 day total of advances minus declines, the number of advancing issues on the New York Stock Exchange less the number of declining issues. And the other indicator was a 21 day total of the, the up volume in the stocks that were up on the day on the New York Stock Exchange less the volume in the stocks that were down on the day. So they, these were two oscillators. Um, and 
So if we came down and tagged the lower band and one of those oscillators was positive, that was a buy alert. And if we went up and tagged the upper band, price tagged the upper band, and one of those oscillators was negative, that was a sell alert. And the the problem with that was the width of the bands. Sometimes you, you needed narrow bands in order to get good signals, and sometimes you needed wide bands in order to get good signals. And for each and every stock, you had to figure out what the width of the bands was going to be. So that was an impossible task when you were doing that uh, by hand. And it was also a problematic task because it let your emotions into the market. If you were if you were bullish, you'd draw the bands to present a bullish picture. If you were bearish, you'd draw the bands to present a bearish picture. And of course, we know that emotions are the, are the trader's worst enemy. So when I saw volatility changing like that, right, I said, well, maybe I can use the volatility to set the width of the bands. And we, yeah, within a week, I had Bollinger bands. Also, so I think it's time everyone is uh, uh, getting very anxious here on the chat. They want to see John Bollinger, how he uses the Bollinger bands and um, how he implements them in uh, mainly in the forex market all right so if well, you... before yeah. before we get to that i'd like to talk about one thing which i think is really important for traders to um absolutely um, to think about and that is you know a question that i get all the time people ask me you know you created the bollinger bands nearly 40 years ago um and yet they're still very popular today and, and still widely adopted and they still appear to to work as well as they did um, yeah. 40 years ago. And that is true. Um, they work very similarly to um, the way they worked every 40 years ago. They have uh, very some very small uh, um, differences, but not meaningful. And that's because Bollinger Bands are based on a first principle, a core principle of the markets. So they're not going to break without that core concept, the market's changing. Okay. In other words, you you have to alter the physical structure of the markets in order to break the bands. And there's another piece that that that's really important too for people to understand. And that is that Bollinger bands uh, are a tool. They're not a trading system. Um, and and wow. people use them all different manners. Uh, some people like to trade tags as a band. Some people like to trade squeezes and bulges. Some people uh, li like to trade uh, uh, when the when the price is strong enough to be walking up the upper band or weak enough to be walking down the lower band. For as many traders as there are, there are that many approaches to Bollinger Bands. Uh, and that's because it's there are simply a set of tools that traders can use to implement the trading approaches that are natural to them. Wow. All right. That's very, very uh, important. And thank you so much for making it clear. So um, should I share the screen and you walk us through the chart we have here? Yeah, sure. Um, Well, just okay. Yep. So I believe everyone we can see the same picture. Yeah, that's the um, USD Japanese yen currency pair on the daily chart. Yeah. So I when I came into the um, when I came into the business. Um, uh, trading was very expensive, um, both from a practical point and from a tax point. Um, so very, very short-term trading wasn't practical unless you were uh, actually a broker-dealer. So I learned to trade with daily and, and weekly charts and to try to capture the big swings on those charts, the, this, the, the swings of 10, 20, 30, 40% that would 
might last from, uh, uh, say, uh, several weeks to several months and, and perhaps even longer. This was the original definition of being a swing trader. And uh, that is the way that I learned to approach the market. Now, of course, today, um, you know, it's a totally different story. Access to real-time data is, is easy. Uh, uh, trading costs are, are extremely low. Um, and um, in many cases, there's actually um, favorable tax treatment available for uh, uh, your profits and, and, and losses. So in, in, in the current environment, um, it's, it's very easy to be a short-term trader versus where I came from, where it was virtually impossible. So the, the daily chart is my, my primary vehicle. Uh, it remains so to today. Um, daily and weekly charts, um, I, I, I very strongly believe in multiple time frame analysis. I always want to have access to a, a chart with a longer time frame to give it uh, a, a frame of reference. So that, that, that's who I am. Uh, um, I'm, you know, intermediate, what I would call an intermediate term swing trader, always have been and, and, and probably always will be. Um, so what you see in front of you is a basic Bollinger Band chart. It is the sort of archetypical um, Bollinger Band chart. The, the blue line that runs through the center of price there is a 20 period moving average. Uh, the red line above it is uh, a line that is drawn two standard deviations above the blue line using exactly the same data that was used to calculate the blue line. So for any given point on that chart, the blue line is the, an average of the prices of the previous 20 periods. And um, the upper line is two standard deviations um, using that same data um, that the um, was used to calculate the blue line. And the same is true for the lower band. Um, that is the blue line minus two standard deviations. The reason the bandwidth changes uh, um, as much as it does um, there, you can is is because volatility is changing. So of course today we 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 know that volatility is volatile. Um, but when I started out, we didn't, and um, it was an enlightenment. Uh, so you can see volatility there. The I have two indicators. Um, uh, drawn beneath um, the the chart. The first one is percent B, and it tells us where we are in relation to the bands. Um, so when percent B is uh, zero, um, price is at the lower band. When percent B is one, price is at the upper band. Um, so I've drawn a green line across percent B to show you um, where that upper limit is and a red line across percent B to show you where that lower limit is. Um, what One feature of the chart, uh, let's see. I don't, are you able to see my mouse? Uh, no, I, I was able to see previously when you uh, dropped the arrows. How about, how about now? No. Okay. So we're going to take a look at, yes, I can see that point on the chart right there. That's a, that's a classic Bollinger Band setup. Um, it's called a W bottom. It's uh, where we make a, a low outside of the lower band followed by a low inside the lower band that's uh, not a new low in relation to the Bollinger Bands. Uh, so it, it, and it leads to a, a, a substantial rally. You can see um, right beneath it on the percent B clip on the left-hand side of that W, percent B is negative. And on the right-hand side of the W, percent B is positive. So percent B is uh, um, derived from the formula for stochastics. And um, so um, it ranges from zero to one. When prices underneath the lower band, it would be negative numbers. And prices above the upper band, it would be positive numbers. And so we look for these patterns uh, um, all the time where where we get divergence between percent B and price. 
and use those as pattern recognition tools. That's a very, very popular um, approach to using Bollinger Bands as uh, pattern recognition. So the, the second indicator that you see on the chart there is called bandwidth, and it tells us how wide the bands are. It's simply the distance from the upper band to the lower band divided by the middle band. For those who remember their statistics from college, it's four times the correlation coefficient. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's four times the coefficient of variation. Um, but you, you don't have to, uh, um, you know, you, you don't have to be, get involved in statistics or math to, to use them. What we're looking for is, is periods where volatility is very low on a relative basis, periods where volatility is very high. So the green lines that you see drawn across bandwidth are the highest value that that um, bandwidth has had in previous hundred periods, and the red lines are the lowest value the bandwidth has had in the previous hundred periods. So that's a uh, um, they, that gives you a relative reference for whether bandwidth is high or low, and uh, um, so. Bandwidth being low is what we call a squeeze, and bandwidth being high is what we call a, a bulge. And squeezes are where trends are born, and, and bulges are where trends go to die. So um, it's, uh, um, it, it's, it's a way of visualizing the volatility cycle and tuning your, your trading approaches um, to what's going on in the volatility cycle. Awesome. Uh, John, at that point, I would just like to say to our audience, guys, any, any question, please uh, start typing them in from now because there are hundreds of people in this webinar and I will, I just see some questions, but I will encourage everyone to start typing your questions or of course, later on, when you have questions, just write them and uh, we're going to deviate about 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer as many as possible, if not all of the questions. So please make sure you start doing that. And um, can I ask you something, John, at this stage? Uh, the audience usually, they, the, the traders usually, they use candlesticks lines or they use a bar chart, but we see uh, something different on the screen. And many people, maybe they are wondering, is that, uh, what is this? So this is the, uh, the, the, the chart, the chart drawing technique that you see on the screen is we call Bollinger bars. Uh, mm -hmm. this is, uh, uh, essentially, um, a cross between a candlestick, um, and a traditional Western bar chart, uh, where I, we've used color to inform um, what goes on. Um, if you look, uh, for example, at this, this, um, that yes. big tall red bar there. Yes. So the, the top of the red zone is the open up of the price for that period. And the bottom of the red zone is the close of the price for that period. The blue section above is the, the distance from the open to the high and the, the blue section below there is the distance from the open um, or from the close to the low. So if we opened and and sold off during the, during the period and closed at the lower, then that center section will be colored red. If we opened um, and then progressed um, and closed higher, then that center section will be green. So what I've done is combine Western bars and candlesticks and used color coding to try to produce the best possible um, vis visualization um, for price. You know, what we're often involved in here is uh, uh, pattern recognition. And I find that, you know, this colorization really helps us pick out the, 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 the patterns that a, as they develop, it's a, just another way of informing um, our eye. We have, we're born with very powerful pattern recognition engines. It comes from our heritage, um, you know, many, many uh, millennia ago where we were um, either living in 
it, on the savannah or at the edge of the jungle. And, you know, we had to recognize predators and, 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 and threats very, very, very quickly. Um, so human beings um, develop very, very strong pattern recognition techniques. So all of what we're doing here, the, the Bollinger Bands, um, percent B bandwidth, um, the Bollinger Bars, all the colorization and, and all of that is to help us inform that innate pattern recognition engine that we have. Of course, um, you can go the opposite way and you can create rigorous training rules using mathematics. Uh, both are, 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 you know, amenable to Bollinger Bands. Um, but, you know, to start with, we wanted to look at a visualization here. Okay, that's pretty unique. And I start seeing that from now on, I will definitely use them into my trading from tomorrow, actually, because as a trader, John, I have to admit that this takes out those uh, weeks. The, the weeks, I believe, they become a bit emotional for a trader. And uh, when you just see like a, like a um, um, a structure like this, it's it's just a bar. It doesn't have so many different names. You just look at the body, and the weeks doesn't take uh, too much of your um, of your effort to analyze the chart. Uh, it looks like you can see uh, the real um, bias in the market, at least from my experience. You know, um, many years ago, um, IFTA, the International Federation of Technical Analysts, invited me to pre present a paper at a at the IFTA conference in Tokyo, um, and I did a, um, a a paper on a, the Japanese candlestick pattern Karakasa. That's where you have a a, a very long body with a a, a very sm small real body at the top. Yeah, a very very small wick at the top and long um, uh, tail below. And what I wanted to show is that combining um, combining candlestick patterns and Bollinger Bands could improve your results because that's what this is all about. This, this is about in, improving your results. It, it's really, really important to remember that trading is the privilege. And um, we, we really don't want to ever do anything that will take us out of the arena, prevent us from coming back tomorrow um, to trade again. So um, w one of the ways you could do that is by combining these techniques to produce a more robust technique. So a Caracasa on its own has maybe a 60% a, a uh, um, chance of success. But when you, when you require a Caracasa to occur at the upper band, and only accept the pattern when it it is in relation to the upper band, then it has an 80% chance. So what we've done is incrementally improve our odds of success. I get, I get, let's let's stop for a second and 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 think about what trading um what trading really is. Um there there are only really two dimensions um that we can explore to improve our trading. We can either improve the number of winning trades versus the number of losing trades, call it a winning percent, um, but whatever, or, or we can improve the size of our winning winners versus the size of our losers. So for example, in the stock market, um, you often have um, people who are interested in, in finding very, very high relative um, strength stocks, the kinds of stocks that would go 100% or 200% or 400% or even 1,000%, the, 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 the giant winners. And they're willing to accept a, a, a lot of very, very small losses. So a lot of little, they, they'll try again and again and again until they find that one big winner. So they, they often will have maybe 90% losing trade, but when they get a winning trade, it's a giant winner. Um, mm -hmm. And and so that that's their approach to the market. We call them home run hitters from the American um, from American baseball. The opposite of that 
is sort of a production trader. He is a trader who who is you know winners are, are maybe twice the size or, or or one and a half times the size of his losers, and and he's maybe sixty percent or seventy percent of uh, of his trades if he's really good. Um, sixty or seventy percent of his trades are winners. So with that, with those kind of numbers, say sixty-five percent winners and a, a win-loss ratio of, of two to one, you can be a very, very successful trader. Yeah, undoubtedly. <laughs> so, um, um, you know that that's what we're trying to do here. We're we're trying to 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 combine parts and pieces um, in a way that allows us. To, to work on improving those dimensions. If we just if we just increment from sixty to sixty five percent in terms of winners percentage of winners versus losers, it's a big improvement in our performance over time. And if we just move from one point five to one point seven um, in terms of the size of our winners versus the size of losers, again over time that's a big improvement. So small changes, right? Very small changes can have very big long-term impacts on, on our performance. Yeah. And it, again, I want, I want to stress that, um, you know, the most important thing in trading is to, uh, um, is, is to have a, a rigorous process that, 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 you know, that, that, that'll keep you out of trouble so that you can, you can come back, um, tomorrow, um, to trade again. It's, it, it, you know, this business, being in this business is is one of the greatest privileges you, you you can have, and you just really really don't want to do anything um, that'll force you to leave. Totally, totally uh, agree, and I'm sure that's what uh, I am trading only for twelve years so far. Uh, but what I see, because I also do coaching to traders and uh, like trading analysis, and I really see that uh, how hard it is for a human to stick to a trading process. And with a couple of losing trades in a row or five trades in a row, um, unfortunately, people, they start blaming their trading system. They start blaming themselves that they should have acted differently. Going back on time on chart, I should have done this. I should have uh, watched that. Which, based on what you explained, of course, that's not the case because we always have to go through losing trades, right? You said 60, 70 percent only to be winners. It means we have to accept that there are going to be losses. Of course, there are going to be losses. We call it breakage, right? Yeah. And you know, think think of it this way: um, what, what what you're doing is you're creating an inventory. It's like you're running a store, right? Or, or you're running a wholesale. You know, you're running a wholesale business, um, and and you know you have merchandise, and and you know some of the some of the merchandise you you buy and it comes in and it's not as good as as you wanted. You can't sell it. That's breakage. You know, some of the some of it you you sell and you ship out and it gets broken in trans. That that's more breakage. You know, and and then some of it nobody wants. And, and, and you're stuck with the inventory and you have to sell it to some jobber. So that's more breakage. You know, all, all of these processes, you know, uh, all of this process it, it involves breakage. So what we're really doing is we're running a trading is a, is, is a business and, 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 and the, the trades are our product. Um, and we want to work on having as many, you know, winners um, as is possible. And we want to work on the, Winners being larger than the than the losers, but again, there's two two approaches to that. That's why I touched on those home run hitters uh, um, before. Uh, uh, a, a friend of mine is a guy by the name of David Ryan. He's pretty famous here as a stock trader in in, in the U.S. And you know he has he has just a terrible breakage rate. He 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 has many many many, but very very small uh, um, losing trades. When he when he gets when he gets a good trade, he hangs on to it and he manages it and he turns it into a big winner, right? So he's a home run hitter. But yeah. you know, yeah. other people, you know, are production hitters. They just they're, they're looking for you know a lot of 
medium term, intermediate term swing trades, uh, um, and and try to keep the breakage down to a, a, as as low as it can possibly be. They would be they would be terribly upset um, if uh, um, they didn't have at least fifty percent winning trades. Uh, whereas David Ryan, you know, I don't know, he could probably have ninety percent losing trades. Wow, wow, but he. But he has a fantastic long-term track record, mm. right? So, it just what 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 this is is you have to decide on your, your trading approach, what you what you're trying to do, who you are, what's comfortable for you. You know, well, everybody always wants me to teach trading system. You know, the magic, the holy grail. If you just do this and do this and repeat, and 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 everything's gonna be okay. It's impossible because well, what I can, you know, what works for me, what I can live with. You can't live with, right? Uh, uh, it it just it, it it's different for everybody. The path to success. There are many paths up the mountain, you know, and and each one, each path up the mountain is unique to that individual. Um, you know, I laugh. Um, I used to teach um, uh, trading seminars. I haven't done so um, in in many years, but inevitably at at, at each trading seminar, I would teach one specific trading system um and i teach it i taught it at every every seminar i ever gave i'm willing to bet that of the i don't know many thousands of people that went to those se seminars fewer than 10 percent of them ever traded it the way i taught it they all went out wow. and they made it they all went out and they made it their own they adjusted it to their own risk and reward tolerances, they 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 went on to to, to turn it into something that they could live with, right? And that's the path to success, not the trading system that I taught you, but the trading system that you create yourself from first principles that 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 you can execute and trade, right? Wow. Joel, at this point, I would like to ask you, because we still have the chart, everyone can see this graph in front of them, and I believe many people are wondering, okay, how can we combine the percentage B and the bandwidth with the Bollinger Bands, with price action and all this stuff, how can we combine them? and create, let's say, a trading plan around so the people, they can um, adjust it based on their risk tolerance and their trading personality, let's say, and uh, try to see if this approach is how it works for them anyway. You know, uh, um, I, I, I tried to show you one... Um before uh, a, a sort of classic it's it's right over here yes the so, double uh, information yeah and and you know this was this was one of the first uh, uh trading I <clears throat> ideas that we ever used with uh, um with um with Bollinger Bands with, with these W's um it come from the work of uh, a guy by the name of Durnell Avery um who did extensive works work on W bottoms and M tops? Um, that work was picked up and codified um, by a brilliant market analyst by the name of Arthur Merrill, um, and that's where I got the inspiration um, for this th this approach. So um, you know this this is a classic example of, of of how to you know do pattern recognition with bullish bands. You, you look for uh, a low outside the lower band um, where percent B is negative. You look for a rally back toward the middle band. You come back and you retest the low. You want percent B to be higher than it was at the first on the left-hand side of the W. And then you wait for confirmation. Um, and, you know, confirmation is a day up. Why do we wait for confirmation? This is probably the this is one of the most important pieces that I'm going to talk about today. Why do we wait for confirmation? Because before we have confirmation, all we have is opinion. But confirmation turns opinion into a tradable fact. 
So when we have a, we, 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 we build a nice little W outside the lower band on this side, inside the lower band on, on, on this side, and then we wait for the market to tell us that it's actually a W, that it's a tradable W. Is this this one here you are referring to? Yeah. Oh, it's the one where I, I drew a, I drew a little arrow pointing to 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 it. It's to just to the right of there. Ah, uh, sorry, we cannot see it. Um, so you don't see this arrow the, here? I see this. Yes, I see this arrow here. Yeah. Okay. So that's the that's the left hand side of the W. Yep. And um, I'm I'm getting getting some help here um, in the annotation process. That's okay. Yep. make the confirmation more understandable because yeah. people, they are wondering, okay, where should I place my buy order? Where should I place my stop loss based on this structure? So I, I just want to thank somebody in my, my office. Zoe uh, came and uh, did the annotations for me. I, I, can, I can talk. Or I can operate a computer, but not so much together. That's okay. <laughs> we really so, appreciate uh, that you're sharing knowledge and. Uh, so the the name of the game here. What? Why? Why is the W such an interesting pattern, and why is a W such an important idea? It's a template. It's not you know, and and why a W is so important is because. It is a trade that has a great risk reward relationship, right? If you if you complete a W and you get you get a, a day up, your confirmation date, your stop goes underneath the 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 low of the pattern, right? So you have a defined risk. Immediately you have a defined risk. You know how much you have to risk to take the trade, and then yep. the 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 target is hopefully um, first the middle band, then the upper band, and then in this case, a walk up the upper band. So that's the name of the uh, of the game in, in 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 trading is to find opportunities. A W is simply a a, a template. It's a prototype of, of of a great trade. A great trade. It's a trade where you have defined risk, you know how much you have to venture in order to to take the trade, and the potential for profit is greater than the defined risk. Of course, there is no, nothing magic that says you're going to have a profit of X. You know, there's no guarantees or anything like that. But you, going into the trade, you you can see what the dynamics are. I'm risking X in pursuit of Y. Also, that's, that, that's how professional traders, you know, approach their work. Can someone, can a trader use this strategy with the uh, Bollinger indicators on uh, lower time frames in uh, Forex? Absolutely. Um, so I, that's why I talked about how I came into the market and why I like daily and, and, and weekly charts. It's simply, that's my area of preference. Yep. Right. That's where I am comfortable. So that's where I stay, but you can use them on one minute charts. You can use them on five minute charts on, 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 on uh, any kind of charts you like hourly charts, half hourly charts. Um, the only limit is that. The item that you're trading be liquid enough so that each period you get fully formed bars. What you want to see is the price me formation mechanism 
at work. Right? Okay. If you, you know, so there has to be enough in activity in each bar. So in, for, I mostly trade stocks, but so a stock like Google, there's virtually no limit, right? You could, you know, you could get away with two second bars if you, if you wanted. There's so much activity that you can see no matter how fine a, a, a snapshot you take, right? You still can see the price formation mechanism at work at that time frame, right? But, yep. you know, uh, uh, an over-the-counter stock that, that trades maybe 10,000 shares a day, maybe, you know, you can't get below daily bars. You know, maybe you're lucky if you, you could, you know, you could draw hourly bars before it all falls apart. So it's entirely dependent on the item that you're trading. Okay. I would imagine, a little upset. Um, not, not being a Forex trader primarily, but I, I would imagine that for, you know, a pair like um, the euro versus the dollar or um, cable or um, um, the euro yen, something like that. Um, um, I, I would imagine that, that there's, you know, you can get down to very, very, very small time frames, and all the mechanisms um, would 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 still work. Absolutely. So, you know, but what's really important is that you find, you know, the time frame that you personally are comfortable in, that you understand, and that fits your trading style. Some people are happy to to you know be glued to the to the screen and watch the dynamics and 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 make a lot of short term trades, and you know. And other people, you know, they just don't want to do that. They they want to, you know, check in a, every once in a while, and you know, when they see a pattern develop, they want to put in, you know, they want to they want to put in their order, their their buy order. If we if we rally up to here, that's confirmation. Okay, I buy here. I it, it, if it executes, then I put place my stop here and a first profit target up here, and come back, you know, sometime later and see what that's in. Entirely a matter of personal preference. Neither approach is better or worse than the other. It's just you know, it's it's whatever you like to do. It's it and, and and it's true with all of this stuff. You just you have to find your own way, what's comfortable for you, um, and what you are able to execute over the long term. Also, you, you know, if 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 you can't take you know three or four losses in a row, if that's really going to materially upset you then you have to find a different trading approach, one that has a higher success rate. Because even at even at a, a 90% success rate, a 90% win rate, you are going to get strings of losses, four, five, six, maybe more, right? It's called the law of large numbers. It's, it, it's you know, it, it, there's no way of avoiding that. Um, but, the, you know, the higher your success rate, the the lower the the those expected runs of uh, adverse outcomes uh, will be. Yeah. So that uh, because I see a lot of questions, they are asking, uh, can you talk about psychology and your experience? What psychology has to do and everything? But uh, thank you so much for deviating so much time and effort to make it so clear to everyone here that um, it's like we have to uh, customize, let's say, the charts based on our personality and not the other way around. Like, because there is a daily time frame, I have to be a end-of-day trader, but I'm not comfortable with that. Or because there is the opportunity of a five-minute chart, I have to trade five-minute chart, but that's not the case. Yeah, some people can. For example, some people can't imagine holding a position overnight. Yeah, they just it, they just can't imagine it. And other people, you know, look at people who day trade and go, "Oh my, I couldn't do that." And that's the important part. It's that. If those people recognize those things about themselves and and and, and tune their trading styles um, uh, to themselves, you know, there's a great book about trading psychology um, by a guy by the name of Mark Douglas called The Disciplined Trader. It's sort of the 
the original um, trading psychology book. And if, if you go back to what I said earlier about the creation of Bollinger Bands, I really created Bollinger Bands to, you know, to take the psychology out of the of the picture. When you draw trading bands by hand, when you have to fit trading bands by hand, um, not only do you have to fit them to each thing that you trade, but you have to change the width over time as the trading regi regime and volatility cycle changes. So e every time you do that is an opportunity to get, you know, for psychology to get involved. That's why I created Bollinger Bands was to eliminate that bit of psychology from my my process. Um, you know, everybody's vulnerable to 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 psychology. Nobody nobody's mastered this thing. You wouldn't be called psychology if somebody could master it. Um, I know we all have foibles and 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 such like that. I in 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 my practice here, I've recently um, been been training. Um, um, a couple of people and um um you know it's it's just really important um for them to do it right um okay. it's you know i can i i can i, I can stand there sit there and, and and help them and teach them arts and, and pieces but what i have to do is i have to learn to step back right <laughs> to, to 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 allow them to 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 take the reins and 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 do the stuff and 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 make the decisions because that's actually the only way they're going to learn. They're not going to learn from me saying do this, do that, do this, do that, do that. That all all they're going to learn is how to obey, right? And it's the last thing you want. Um. So anyway, it's just an aside about so. Also, uh, can I go through some? questions here and hopefully we can uh, answer as many as uh, as possible so uh guys uh apologies if i don't read your question there are so so many questions i'm gonna just randomly pick um a question uh can we find the percentage b and bandwidth on in metatrader 5 or how um, we access these indicators. So we don't support MetaTrader 5 directly. Um, uh, but as I understand it, um, the Bollinger, the percent B and bandwidth um, um, have been created. Um, so I, I would just um, Google um, for those indicators um, and then you can download them and use them. Um, the formulas are um, are very straightforward. Um, their formulas are in the public domain. If you have any problems with that, um, you can drop me a note, and I'm happy to be happy to send you the formulas for them. My email is my email is bbands. That's b b a n d s at bollingerbands.com. If you need the formulas, but the formulas are, are 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 widely available. There's also a lot of tutorial um, information sure. on my website bollingerbands.com that might be helpful to new users of Bollinger Bands. Okay, I will send all the information on the chat, so that's not a problem at all. Um, uh, another question. How do we identify change of trend using Bollinger Bands? Uh, well, we've talked about one way that, that that's really useful, um, um, and that is um, W bottoms and M tops. Uh, those are the, the classic ways of defining turning points um, in the markets that I still think um, that they are the most um, the the most useful to ident for identifying turning points. You have to re remember um, that if you have um, when when you have a trend, um, say an uptrend, and you're walking up the upper band, uh, you, you'll 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 get pullbacks in that trend trend that will separate. 
um, from the band. What you're looking for is 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 not just a pullback, but the subsequent rally that um, when um, it it's a momentum failure, and you can see that in terms of uh, percent B. Um, you you'll get uh, typically going into a high. Now uh, you can see it over here. Um, you can see it over here. You you have a. Let's see if I can get back to my arrows. So there you have a a, a series of, of of attempts. You have a short walk up the upper band, and then you have a series of attempts um, to regain the upper band. And then look underneath here at, at at percent B, and each time percent B is a lower peak. So price is going up and percent B is going down. That's a, a classic momentum divergence. So ideas like that are, you know, the, the core ideas in, in, in tactical analysis. If you want to see another W bottom, there's one right there. Yep. Bye. You know, um, so they're everywhere. Just uh, um, just have to pay attention. Also, also, so pretty much uh, because I took some notes here, and uh, I I like you make it so clear that Bollinger Bands is a tool. The rest of the um, market analysis we we. We generally broadly use like uh, this is a higher high, this is a higher low, and vice versa, and uh, all the basic structure are remain as they are. We don't abandon them, and we exclusively use uh, the Bollinger Band indicator. Is that correct? Um, look, more or less. Um, you know, well, everybody's going to have a different opinion. Um, one of the things that I really I, I I wanted to mention that I forgot to to mention is to keep it simple, you know. You use, use yeah. just a few tools, um, and you know try to understand what each um, each and every tool that you use um, actually is doing. One of the things that we always do when we we build a new system or a new approach here is we 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 write it into an Excel spreadsheet, uh, and we go through it line by line by line, you know, to see how does price change? How does it impact the indicators we're using? Where, you know, when, when we get a, um, when we get a signal from the system, you know, how, how, what, what did price and the indicators look like be, before that? Um, it, can, can, can we get rid of one of those indicators? Is, is it redundant? You know, can, can we distill things down to, to, to a sim simpler approach? going through bar by bar and actually looking at the numbers, right? It, it, this comes, you know, because we kept all this stuff by hand um, when I started out. Um, and, and so, you know, to this day, I need to actually see the numbers um, and see how, um, you know, I, let's look at this for a minute. A very, very popular tool that people love to use is RSI Wells Wilder's Relative Strength yep. Index? It's probably um, um, in the in the in the top three or four technical indicators um, that are used in in the world today. Yep. Um, yep. But do you know actually how it behaves? Right. So I try to tell people if you're going to use RSI, what you need to do is you you need to put it into a spreadsheet and and, and you know and and look at the data. Um, and see how it's calculated, and see how those averages are changing. Then you can tell in advance what sort of price change you're going to need to get a specific change in RSI. Assume you have a simple trading system. We're going to sell if RSI crosses below 70, and, and you're trading. Well, by putting this into a spreadsheet, you can figure out that if, if price drops to 52.34, that's going to be enough to trigger that signal. So you can then anticipate the signal before it happens, right? But you can only do that if you understand 
that calculation. Most people just put these put these indicators on on, on the screen and use them blind without ever understanding, right? You, you, and and then that's a terrible sin. You you really need to to get. Whatever indicators you're going to use, whether it's Bollinger Bands or RSI or Stochastics or um, Ichimoku uh, um, charts or whatever, whatever they are, you actually need to go through the period by period calculations and get to understand that indicator and the price structure of the item you're trading with that indicator intimately so that you know this stuff. And you're never surprised, right? And, and, and su yeah. surprises mean that you can't come back. There's a little note I made myself. It said, trading is a privilege. Don't muck it up. Wow. <laughs> because surprises are what mucks it up. Yeah. The, way, the, the, the way we avoid surprises is by knowing the price structure of what we're trading and by knowing the indicators that we're trading it with. Also, so that plays major, um, major. It's a major component in trader psychology, right? Because as we said earlier, uh, as you make it clear, by five losses in a row, uh, if you know upside down how your system, your indicators, and your tools you're using on the chart, um, then you are still confident to take the sixth, the seventh, the ninth trade. Yeah. Because it's, as Mark Douglas um, says in the book, uh, we don't know the sequence of the winners and losers and when they're going to occur, right? So, correct. So it's the other portion is, it's also important to recognize regime change when it hits. Um, uh, because, you know, um, you know, markets do change. For example, um, you know, a lot of people have built trading systems in, in in America here based on a volatility index. We call the VIX that's derived from options trading activity. Well, in the past year, um, we, we've had a major structural change in our options market. And the VIX now behaves differently than it did before. Right. Yeah, so it's really important, you know, to understand when there's structural change occurring, because that might mean that you need to stop trading that approach and wait to see how it's going to perform in the new environment and whether it needs to be adjusted to match the new environment that it is facing. Regime change is relatively rare in the in, in our markets, our markets are, are actually pretty stable. I can think over the years of, you know, a very small number of regime changes have occurred in my career. But this VIX change that, that we're seeing this year is clearly an example of regime change. So, for example, if uh, in Forex, you know, if uh, um, the Chinese say... Um, uh, decided to let the RMB float, that would be regime change for the RMB pairs, right? So it can, you know, things can occur um, uh, that change. If, um, for example, the Swiss, as they did some years back, um, decided that they were no longer going to defend parity, right? Yep, that's a regime change. Um, and it means that history prior is not comparable to the reality after, and you have to adjust yeah. um, to 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 meet that. So the regime change is rare, but you need to be alert for it because it's one of those things that could, you know, that 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 could really hurt. Also, so another question: we have a few more minutes, and uh, let's uh, see this one. The W pattern works on any time frame or only on daily chart? Any time frame. As long as there's enough data inside each bar so that the bars are fully formed and you can see 
the price formation mechanism that work. It doesn't work if there's 10 ticks in a bar, right? I mean, you want to have hundreds of ticks in every bar. So for 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 some pairs that are inactively traded, maybe um, you can only, you know, maybe hourly bars are the limit or, or 10 minute bars yeah. are the limit. For 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 cable, maybe, you know, 10 second bars are, are will, will work. But it's it, it, all of the things that I've talked about um, are not time frame dependent. Um, it, it, it the, the, you know, it's uh, we're running out of time. So, uh, uh, okay. a final comment that I think really um, is, is important for people to consider is always, always, always look at higher time frames. Be aware of what's going on around you. Um, we have a, whole, have a whole bunch of rules that we teach about the short, intermediate, and long term time frames. The short term time frame is it is it is for execution. The intermediate term time frame is where you you make your decisions and and, and manage your stops and, and 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 do stuff like that. And the long term time frame is is the environment that you're you're trading in. Are you in a big bull market or are you in a big bear market? Uh, uh, stuff like that. So always you know look to higher time frames for guidance so that you have some idea of the environment um, that you that you're working in. Thank with you. that, it's really been a super pleasure to spend time with you today. Um, you know, uh, I stress that if you, you know, this tutorial material on BollingerBands.com, um, there's, uh, um, you know, if you need the formulas for the indicators, feel free to drop uh, an email to bbands at BollingerBands.com. And, you know, be disciplined and I wish you good trading. Absolutely. Um uh- Thank you so so much for uh, being for for being here and spend the time with us. In the meantime, I will share all the the links and your website um, with the audience so they can reach you directly or they can go to the uh, to the website and find more information. Uh, I think it was very very clear to everyone that by using the Bollinger Bands and uh, putting some effort to le- to really learn uh what's the how they construct and how um how to use them uh in their trading will add so much value uh to each and every one traders and uh yeah i think that's all from us today as well We would like to thank you one more time and thanks everyone for your participation. Uh, Myself and Admirals, we really like to say a big thank you and uh, we look forward to see you next time, uh, Mr. John. Take care. Thanks, Theo. Thank you. Bye-bye.